And I, I happen to have a few words here from Mr. Moore. And so if you will, imagine a little more hair here and here. And imagine, you'll have to imagine an accent which I will not attempt to go anywhere near. So this is from Alan Moore. He says, if I may, I'd like to strike a sour note from the onset with regard to my unfathomable and near pathological aversion to awards. I've witnessed far too many good and valuable creators make awards a measure either of themselves or of their craft and suffer subsequent inertia or derangement. If they fail to win one, they become unbearable in their own eyes, and if they win one, they become unbearable to everybody else. <laughs> Age just 11, I was made head prefect at the primary school that I attended in Spring Lane, thus ruinously altering my personality. Berserk with power, I became tyrannical and autocratic in my duties as milk monitor <laughs> and personally believed that I was a short step away from unexplained mass graves on the school playing field and a tight-lipped appearance in a glass box at some pediatric version of The Hague. Perhaps as a result of this, in later life, I find I have a tendency to shun awards and while appreciating the goodwill they represent to get them out of my immediate environment as quickly as possible. I am currently residing in a sterilized and strictly accolade-free zone with one unique exception. This, it hardly need be said, is the Bram Stoker that I had the honor of receiving in 2004, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. One might ask why this is the sole survivor of a cull that saw its fellow statuettes, certificates, and once, I promise, a container of Bart Simpson bubble bath, which had a sticker with Lifetime Achievement Award printed on it covering the barcode <laughs> that saw all of these consigned to history. Firstly, and least importantly, I have to say, the award is in itself a beautiful piece of art. A beautiful creation that I never tire of looking at and handling. Secondly, and crucially, there is the provenance of the award to be considered. The Bram Stoker is, to me, a priceless token of appreciation from a group of people for whom I have limitless respect and admiration, these being my fellow workers at this darkest of all coal faces. The landscape of imagination, and especially its less hospitable far boundary, is perhaps the most important human territory of all, and so to feel acknowledged by a lineage of fine writers which extends from the great old ones of the past to the still unrevealed giants yet to come means more to me than I can readily express. As is often the case when one's work crosses personal boundaries, I spent a long time in fretful deliberation over Neonomicon, and six months after finishing the work was still uncertain as to whether it was good or even publishable. These doubts dwindled at first glimpse of Jason Burroughs' wonderfully controlled delineations, both unflinching and meticulous, and have vanished entirely on receipt of this remarkable award. To all of you, thank you so much for this. You've made me an unkempt and increasingly bewildered old man very happy. <laughs> so, thank you, Mr. Moore. And once again, I will be mindful of the post stoker's alcohol consumption. <laughs> Presenting the award for superior achievement in a young adult novel, please welcome one of tonight's Lifetime Achievement Award winners and the chair of this year's YA jury, Rick Howdala and Lynn Hansen. We're not going to sing. We're not going to dance. <laughs> We're here to give the award for superior achievement in a young adult novel. And the nominees are Ghosts of Coronado Bay, Amaya Blair Mystery by J.G. Faraday. <laughs> the Screaming Season by Nancy Holder. Rotters by Daniel Krauss. Yeah. <laughs> Dust and Decay by Jonathan Mayberry. Yeah. A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness. Yeah. 
and this dark endeavor, The Apprenticeship of Victor Frankenstein by Kenneth Oppel. And the stoker goes to, it's a tie. The Screaming Season by Nancy Holder and Dustin Decay by Jonathan Mayberry. to go after Alan Moore's speech. Oh my gosh. Um, I want to thank all the other nominees. Um, YA, I'm so glad to see it back in our awards. It's a really big field right now and I encourage all of you to give YA a shot. It's a very exciting world and I'm very proud to be a part of it, but I'm more proud to be a member of HWA and to be here tonight with you. Um, it's meant so much to me to be here. I was at that Howell meeting. So thank you guys, and I'm grateful to everyone who voted for the screaming season, and I'm more grateful to be among you tonight, and congratulations to Jonathan, who's also one of my editors, and um, I'm very happy that we both received awards, but all of the nominees were phenomenal, and thanks again very, very much, and I want to tell Joe a funny story. I was signing books in the dealer's room, and I said, oh, I'm in this. It's Razored Saddles. I'm in it. And I said, no, wait, I'm not in it. I just love it a lot. <laughs> and the bookseller said, I get that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for not being Jonathan Mayberry, something I do in the mirror every morning. But he did email me his acceptance speech. He says, just in case we need it. It's a great honor to accept this Stoker Award. Sorry I couldn't be with you all this year, but a family health issue is keeping me here in Pennsylvania, damn it. You guys are a lot more fun. Thank you for this award. Dustin Decay was such fun to write. It allowed me to bring together two of my favorite storytelling elements, gratuitous zombie violence and my lingering adolescence. It's also an honor to be included among the nominees. So many of my friends have been nominated this year. It's no joke to say that I would have celebrated any of these books if they had won. So my heartfelt thanks to my friends and colleagues in the Horror Writers Association. It's so important to keep the horror genre alive and to prove year after year after year that horror fiction stands shoulder to shoulder with the very best writing being published today. Thank you all. Jonathan Mayberry. Let's see if I get down off the stage. Vampires. Some are ferocious, bloodthirsty creatures. Some are hot hunks of burning love. Some are frightening monsters lurking in the shadows. Some are lovable puppets who teach kids their numbers. Some are upbeat. Some are less upbeat. Some disintegrate in the sunlight. Some do not. However they are presented, the vampire remains one of the most popular fixtures of our genre, and tonight we present our first award for the Vampire Novel of the Century. Presenting the award for Vampire Novel of the Century, please welcome the chair of this award's jury, and also the author of Dracula the Undead, Les Klinger and Dager Stoker. I assume everyone knows that this is the centenary of the death of Bram Stoker, and the board of directors felt it was appropriate to create this special one-time award. We were thrilled to have it co-sponsored by the Bram Stoker Family Estate and the Rosenbach Museum and Library. Um, I want to start by thanking the jury who worked very hard on this, Linda Addison, uh, Ron Bresnay, James Doerr, uh, and uh, Joe Fletcher. Um, we read dozens and dozens of, of novels. Our criteria was that it had to be impactful. It had to be an important book, not just one that we loved. Um, that made it really hard. Our long list was over 35 books. Uh, we cut it down to six, and I will, 
I'd like to go through the nominees now and, and remind you of these great books. These are in alphabetical order by author. The first was published in 1987, I'm sorry, by 1983 by Donald M. Grant. It's The Soft Whisper of the Dead by Charles L. Grant. <laughs> this novel was the first of the Oxrun tales to be placed in other than a contemporary setting. It was the first of a trilogy of historical horror novels and an important novel in setting the tone for what was to come in the future of vampire fiction. In 1975, it's hard to believe the dates on some of these. In 1975, Doubleday published a little book called Salem's Lot by Stephen King. <laughs> People who thought the traditional vampire story was old-fashioned, out of date, couldn't be done again, were proven, as we say, dead wrong by this story. In 1954, Trade paperback from gold medal, Richard Matheson, I Am Legend. If you missed the three movies that this has been made into, just wait. There'll be another three or four coming down the road, I'm sure. Um, a very unusual book, nonetheless groundbreaking. 1992 from Simon and Schuster, Anno Dracula by Kim Newman. Kim showed us that there were more stories to be told about that same character Dracula. There are more universes to explore if we just look. And finally, uh, two two more that turned to what shall we say the softer side of vampires. Hard to believe, 1976, Alfred A. Knopf, Interview with the Vampire by Anne Rice. <laughs> it seemed to reinvent the genre um, in ways that we, we didn't know were possible, but almost simultaneously, it was in the air in 1978 from St. Martin's Press, Hotel Transylvania by Chelsea Quignarbro, who... <laughs> Again, wrote about the romantic vampire and showed us that there was more stories to be told about a 2,000-year-old vampire. So we worked long and hard to deliberate. I'm going to let Dacre tell us who the winner of the award is. Thank you. Les, just before I do, I've got to say that on behalf of the Bram Stoker State and the Stoker family that we are deeply indebted to the work of the Har Writers Association for bestowing this, this honor on Bram for the last 25 years. Uh, his death went greatly overshadowed uh, almost 100 years ago, April 20th, because April 12th, great marine tragedy happened just before Bram died, and that's the sinking of the Titanic. And uh, that overshadowed Bram's death, but the recognition you guys bring, I think I haven't really heard too many uh, Titanic awards for the best sailing job <laughs> through an ice field. So I thank you for that. The six nominees are authors with impressive lists of novels and resumes, a veritable dream team of horror writers. I can envision these six authors sitting at a table with my great-granduncle Bram at the head and having a good dinner and some claret and chatting about their accomplishments. In their own unique ways, these authors have kept us all entertained and horrified, adding their own special characteristics and twists to their own vampire mythologies, adapting their creatures to various times and settings, all the while staying true to the original course that Bram helped chart over 100 years ago. The winner of the centenary Vampire Novel of the Year, I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Yeah. Richard's. Richard couldn't be with us tonight because of his health, but he did record um, uh, some brief remarks.